All right, back of the show is Gerald Mearshard. He's been the talk of the town as of late, as on September 19th, a little over a week from right now, he's going to take on Hamzat Shemaev in Las Vegas. It's been a, a wild month, to say the least, for this man, that's for sure. Gerald, good to see you, man. How are you? Good to see you again, Mike. How you been? I've been all right. Uh, haven't had a crazy stretch of time like you've had, but uh, where are you right now? It doesn't, uh, you know, this is a different kind of a setup. Where are you right now? What are you doing? Yeah, right now I'm in a hotel room in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm down here with uh, Duke Rufus and uh, working with him and Tyron Woodley and Dean Thomas. So obviously we're fighting on the same card. Tyron's the main event, so we're all helping each other get ready for September 19th. Nice. So I wake up this morning, Gerald, and I'm getting ready to start my day. I usually just kind of lay back and scrolling through stuff like I normally do and I see you're all over the interweb. You're doing interviews with everybody, doing interviews with ESPN. All the Johnny Come Latelys are coming out to talk to Gerald Mearshard now. Like, what have you made of of all this attention over the last five to six days? Ah, I love it. I love that finally I get to be in the spotlight a little bit. And, you know, uh, I saw a comment on something I did. It's like, oh, I never heard this guy talk before. Now I'm a fan. It's like, well, give me the mic and let me go and (laughs) I'll get some more fans. So, I mean, as people know, it's it, this kind of all began on August first. You're supposed to fight Ed Herman, and then we find out about the positive COVID test hours before this event is about to start. Then the fight is rebooked with Ed for this Saturday, and he's on his third different opponent now. I'm curious, was it precautionary reasons that led to you not fighting this weekend? Because we've heard stories about, I guess, like lingering positive tests lasting for weeks, in some cases a month or more. Is that what happened here? That's exactly what happened. I, I kept coming back with positive tests, and it was one of those things. I talked to my manager uh, and my coach, and you know, I had to quarantine for two weeks first of all. So, I, you know, I'm still training at home. I got a little home gym. You know, it's not the same necessarily, but I'm still doing something right. And for me, I was very fortunate that my symptoms. I had like a stuffy nose for a couple of days. That was it. So that wasn't a big deal. But, um, you know, after not being in the gym for so long, I. Uh, was trying to see if maybe we could fight at a later date, but they needed him to fight like very, very soon. And I was like, well, I keep coming back, you know, even before that, I keep coming back with these positive tests. I don't want to waste my time. I don't want to waste the UFC's time. I don't want to waste Ed Herman's time. Go all the way out there, you know, because at this point, all I knew that was happening is that they were still testing people when they got to the venue. So now we're doing uh, testing before they even fly us out, which is very smart on the UFC's part, you know, see if you can figure it out before you even get there. Because in this case, I was over, you know, all the doctors I talked to, they're like, you can go back to normal doing whatever you want. It's just that I know I can't fight if I have the positive test. So, you know, it would be different before I didn't test positive till like literally I got woke up at 8 a.m. the day of the fight. And they were like, hey, you tested positive last night. Run down here. We're going to test you again. We'll have the results back in four hours. Hopefully it was a, a false positive, but ended up not being that way. So here we are. That's craziness. Have have you taken other tests since then? Like, are you good to go now? Uh, I took a couple tests and got negative um, pretty much after we had made the decision not to take the September 12th fight. And I was like, well, of course, right after I'm like, oh, hey, you know, I keep testing positive, probably shouldn't do it. And then, you know, the week following, I get a couple negative tests. And it's like, well, I already said, no, I'm not going to, you know, jerk their chain back around forth. But luckily they needed a replacement for somebody else. And, you know, I get a little more time to train, so I'm not mad about that. I mean, the fight with that Herman got a lot of people excited. It was kind of like a, a low-key banger that everyone just kind of got fired up about. But this is a super interesting situation you're in now because now you're facing a guy in Hamzat Shemaev who has guarded all this buzz over the last couple of months after jumping on Fight Island and getting a couple of finishes in like a week and a half. First off, when you and your team were approached about this fight, how surprised were you that – Shemaev was the other name on the contract. Was that surprising to you? Yeah, I never, you know, I when I had seen him and he said he'd go back and forth, you know, just offhandedly, it was like, oh, I'd fight that guy if he, you know, tried to take an 85 fight, especially with all the steam behind his name and everything. But I never thought that it was going to happen, especially this quick. And then, you know, I found I found out maybe a day before the internet did. I think, like, they sort of breaking news about this on like Wednesday or Thursday. And I find, I think I found out like Tuesday maybe or something like that, signed the contract a couple days after. So, you know, I found out pretty much with you guys. <laughs> there's like you said, there's, there's a lot of buzz around him right now because of those two fights. And, and 
this doesn't happen all that often in our sport to this extent after only two fights. With Hamza, like, why do you think that is? Like, do you get this appeal or are you more in the why is this a thing camp? I understand why, you know, I've been around long enough and I've seen the direction the sport has gone and like the, the way the UFC likes to build people up. And it makes sense. He's young. He's undefeated. Uh, you know, he had two very quick fights back to back where he looked very dominant. And a lot of, you know, because they were so quick back to back, a lot of people overlook the opponents they had. Right. He had a guy that moved up from lightweight to welterweight that, you know, wasn't a challenge at all. Um, you know, and I don't know, maybe that guy had a bad night, maybe he's different, but from what we saw on that night, it didn't look like it was, you know, much of a challenge. And then he fought a guy who was an 85er, you know, it looked like he had a tough weight cut, and really his thing is more he likes to stand and bang. So, you know, it's pretty pretty easy work if you're a competent grappler, and clearly it was. So that being said, you fight fast enough, people overlook those two things. And on top of it, you fight just like a guy who's a champion right now and also undefeated. You know what I mean? In this case, because most times, you know, people want to see guys stand and bang and knock each other out, right? Well, you fight exactly like Khabib, and you're also undefeated from the same area. You're, you know, he's doing the I, I will smash him same whole shtick. Of course, they're going to take it and run with it. You've been in this situation a few times in your career when it comes to fighting guys with a little bit of hype behind them. Like your UFC debut comes to mind because I remember covering that event in Albany and the Joe Gelati story. You, you know, people were talking about him and you went in there and did your thing. But there's one fight specifically that sticks out to me. And that was before you got in the UFC 2016. You're getting ready to fight Sidney Wheeler. He's 5-0. and oh. Everybody's talking about this guy as a young up-and-coming prospect. I, I remember the promotions reaching out to everybody. you got to talk to this Sid Wheeler kid. He's 20 years old. This kid's a savage. He's got to be in the UFC. And then you go out there and you finish him in the first round. And then Brendan Allen finishes him in the second round. And then since he's fought you, he's been 3-4. and four. And coincidentally enough, his last loss was in 35 seconds to Hamzat Shemaev in Brave, which is crazy. Like, does this situation feel similar to the Wheeler one, but just like on a bigger scale? A little bit, yeah. I, I definitely think Hamza's going to be tougher for sure, right? You know, Sid had a lot of hype behind him. Uh, and not saying he was like bad. Obviously, he wasn't like a low level local fighter. He had some wins at the time, right? But, you know, that next step up is a little bit different. And, um, like I said, we both finished him in the first round. Uh, Hamza finished him in 35 seconds really quick. However, in that fight, Sid came at him and threw his little flurry of punches. He didn't like that. You know, he kind of freaked out for a second and then shot in, and then obviously it didn't really matter much because it was over real quick. I came at Sid when I fought him and tried to take his head off. And then when he took me down, I was like, all right, fine, I'll just snap your arm. And, you know, I ended up getting the submission. So it, it took maybe a little bit longer, but I was the aggressor from bell to bell, whereas Kamzat, like, he took a little bit to get going. Well, once he got going, he was fine. So did you take anything away from Sid's performance that maybe you'll be the aggressor in this one as well? Uh, not really. I mean, that's all that, that kid does, right? And, you know, that's true. him doing that was really – well, I'm just being honest. It's true. No, you're right. You know, my – yeah, my game plan has nothing to do with that. So I got – again, I'm a pretty well-rounded guy. You know, the only – wins i seem to be allowed to have in the ufc or finishes so you know i i definitely don't want it to go to decision right but i'm also dangerous everywhere i've knocked people out i've submitted them from my back from being on top you know after ground and pound all kinds of stuff so you know he's got to worry about me more than i got to worry about him as far as he does the same exact thing every fight he's going to drop to his knee shoot a double leg and if he doesn't get that he's going to come up to a body lock and then he's going to get you down. He's going to try and lace your legs up with his legs, or he's going to try and wrist ride from like a referee's position and hit you until he chokes you. Well, I'm not going to be dumb and go right to my hands and knees and try and stand up the way he wants. I can submit people off my back. I can definitely submit him off my back. So I'm not worried about it. So he's got to think about, you know, what way is this guy going to try and finish me and how do I navigate that? The other piece of the story that you've talked a lot about over the last several days is the fact that Hermayev has a fight with Damian Maya already on the books after he fights you. Now it's going to take place in November. You felt disrespected, disrespected by that and understandably so. But on Tuesday night, Dana White is speaking with the media after the contender series. And he was asked about that specifically and said, in essence, it's not disrespect. You know, it's just that Dana, I'm willing to roll the dice on a guy with that kind of confidence. He can't prove he can do it if he doesn't get the chance to do it. So did you hear or see those comments? And if so, does it make you feel any differently about it? 
Uh, I saw the quote and a, a little clip with it. So on one hand, you know, you want to be a good promoter. You you got this opportunity, right, that you can build this guy up and, you know, in essence, set him on a track to make him a superstar. So why wouldn't you do that? Totally get that from a business perspective. On the other hand, it also kind of sounded like, uh, you ever seen Talladega Nights? Yeah. Sounded like Ricky Bobby. Was like, Just because you say no disrespect, you can't then say something super disrespectful afterwards. <laughs> it's like, it's not disrespectful, but I'm definitely going to do something that most people consider disrespectful right after. So a little bit of a double-edged sword there. This is going to be your 45th professional fight, which is wild to even think about at this point because I've been following you for a while. The Duran win fight earlier this year, I remember speaking to you about that. You were fired up for that one. You wanted to kick his ass because of the trash talk. It's had things to say even before he made his UFC debut before the Eric Spicely fight. You were really fired up for that fight. How would you compare this fight with Shamayev to the Duran win matchup with how you feel internally about it? Uh, I'm even more fired up for this one, honestly. I mean... You know, and it's strange, too, because to his credit, uh, Chamayev, like, he hasn't really been saying nothing. Like, he doesn't talk that much, right? And he's he's doing what he should do. He's, you know, from a different place. He's got an accent. His whole mystique is don't talk that much. Say the same two things over and over, and then people are going to jump on it as long as you keep fighting how you're fighting. For me, it's a little bit different. But even though he's not, like, coming at me directly – he feels that he can do that. And I know deep down he feels it like, oh, yes, I must use Stepping Stone to get to Damian Maya. And I'm not cool with that. So now he wants to go from you to Maya to both Diaz brothers. I don't know if you caught that at all. Yeah, I, well, I saw that and he was like, oh, I'll fight both Diaz brothers, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. At this point, he's just taking what he's been given and trying to make the most of it. So hats off to him for that. Right. I mean, that wasn't – maybe I would have packaged it a little bit differently – but, you know, again, all he's got to do is say, like, two or three things and he'll be okay. Will, I mean, will the social media warfare game continue to be part of the buildup on your end to this fight? Because you've posted some of these funny pictures. They're starting to come out a little bit more and more. I saw the, the Thomas, the, the train photo with his face on it, tilted over. My kid appreciated that, by the way. But, you know, you did a lot <laughs> of it for the Duran win fight. Are we going to see more and more of this leading into next Saturday? Yeah, you know, you might see a couple more. I mean, we'll see what happens. I'm, you know, like I said, I've been traveling around a lot, getting ready for this fight. You know, I'll be in Missouri for a little bit, and then I'll head back to home. So if I got some spare time on my hands, you might see a little bit more. Do you have a uh, gambling friends, Gerald? Because right now you're an over four to one underdog in this fight. You have like 38 more fights in this guy, and you're a four to one dog. How crazy is that with all of your experience? Like four to one underdog? That sounds a little. A little misguided here, if we're being honest. Yeah. No. Well, I remember someone was asking me about that, and I I think the last I heard, he was minus five something, and I was minus like three or 350. And I, I even guessed offhand, I was like minus six and plus four. And then it was like, oh, you're pretty close. And I was like, of course. Of course I am. So, yeah. Any, anyone that likes betting money on, you know, on anything, I, this would be a pretty good bet for you to take right now. There's a lot of upside that people aren't seeing. There you go. I mean, you've done this long enough to know that you can't look past any date or any opponent, regardless of experience. But have you thought about what a win over Shamayev could lead to for you? Like, do you feel like this could launch you into a different place in your career? Oh, it would definitely help a lot. Uh, a lot of people keep asking me, oh, well, if you win, do you want to fight Maya? And look, as far as I know, Maya's staying at 170. And if there's one thing I do know is that I'm not cutting to 170, first of all. <laughs> Second of all, I'm not really thinking about anybody else. I'm thinking about uh, Hamzat Chimaev on September 19th. You know, there's to me nothing hap There's nothing after that. Right now, I'm very one track, singular minded. That's all I'm here to do. So he can think about how many people he's going to run through by the end of the year. I'm just thinking about him. It's just me and him locked in the cage. How's Tyron doing right now? He's got a big one ahead of him. Lost his last couple fights, about to fight Colby Covington. This is the fight we've been waiting for for years now. It's finally going to happen next Saturday. How's he doing? What's his mindset like right now? Uh, he's looking good, man. You know what I mean? I, I was with a big part of his camp for the Robbie and Darren Till fights, um, and he's looking just as good, if not better, than he did for both those fights. You know, his conditioning's on point. The hands are moving fast and in high volume, so if anyone's worried about that, he's – you know, there's a lot of punches being thrown. Like, he's mixing it up really well. He He's definitely going to put 
Mr. Covington on his butt a few times. Before that happens, you have your own business to take care of. How do you take care of this business? How do you derail this train on September 19th, Gerald? I just got to break him mentally. And I know it's not going to be easy. Look, again, undefeated, tough kid. He thinks he can take on the world. But what's going to happen when he runs into somebody that doesn't lay over for him? What's going to happen when what he wants to do is the worst thing to do for him? I'm going to frustrate him. I'm going to make him make mistakes. And then he's going to find himself in a position he's not used to. And he's going to have to either give up, go to sleep, or he's going to get an appendage broken off. Fair enough. I know you got some training to get ready for. Crazy times, man. This is this is what a month it has been. What a week it has been. Big opportunity for you on September 19th. The focus is clearly there for this one. Safe travels to you to Vegas. Gerald, all the best to you in the fight. Appreciate it, Mike. Good talking to you.